All right, so your next exam is gonna be available this weekend. Um, I have Friday on the schedule, um, but I realized that I can certainly bump it back and give you more time to study this material. So it'll be available Saturday evening through Sunday. And um, there will be uh, worksheets available for you on Canvas for the three different systems that we're covering. The circulatory system one is up now and the immune and respiratory will go up tomorrow. So please keep an eye out for those to help, um, help you with your studying. And for today, we are gonna talk about a very different system than the ones we've been covering. So we're gonna go over the immune system as well as the lymphatic system, which are kind of the same thing and also not the same thing. And that's why this is very, very weird. Um, this is just an adorable little diagram of the different cells of the immune system as cartoons, cells, like it. So the immune system is defined as a collection of cells and organs throughout the body that destroys or neutralizes pathogens that would cause disease and death. The lymphatic system is defined as a series of vessels, ducts, and cells that return excess fluid to the blood and filter, destroy, filter and destroy um, pathogens in that fluid in the lymph nodes. So some of the cells and organs that are used by the immune system are the lymphatic system. Um, and so these systems are simultaneously the same thing and also kind of separate. Um, in some books, you will find them taught separately, and in some, you will find them taught together. The lymphatic system considered alone, though, doesn't do very much, so it makes more sense to integrate them together and tackle all of it at once. So um, the lymphatic system is going to also be working very closely with uh, the cardiovascular system. And that's because it um, is in charge of returning fluid that escapes out of the capillaries back into the blood. And while it's returning that fluid, it filters it for pathogens and any other foreign material and alerts the immune system if it finds it and cells of the immune system are in the lymph nodes that are doing the filtering. So we're gonna start with looking at the components of the lymphatic system, and then expand that out to look at the additional components um, that are not lymphatic, but are part of the immune system. So the lymphatic system is mostly a series of vessels that are returning this fluid, um, additional extracellular fluid that should have gone back into the capillaries, but doesn't make it back in. But we're trying to get it back into the blood because if we didn't, we would really rapidly run out of blood volume. So the lymphatic vessels are um, throughout the body. The fluid that's running in them is called lymph. It's very similar to um, the extracellular fluid. Uh, or interstitial fluid that surrounds the cells and the tissues. Lymph nodes are within the lymphatic vessel course and the fluid goes through them to get filtered. But then there's additional lymphatic tissues and lymphatic organs that aren't connected to the vessels but are still considered part of the system. They are also considered to be the major structural components of the immune system because the vast majority of lymphocytes live in these organs and tissues most of the time. Now, sometimes they're circulating in the blood. They're part of the components of white blood cells. Um, but the ones that are in the blood are just a small percentage. The majority of them are in the lymph nodes as well as these other lymphoid organs and tissues. So the spleen, the thymus, the tonsils, and then um, diffuse tissues embedded in pretty much every other system in the body. Here's a diagram that we use um, when we're showing all of this off. So the little green squigglies are how we represent lymphatics. 
since we typically draw blood vessels as blue or red, for whatever reason, they decided that green was the right color for lymphatics. This is also showing you the thymus, which sits above the heart, uh, the spleen, which is in the left side of the abdominal cavity. Um, we have a lot of lymphatic tissue in our intestines, bone marrow represented by a single bone, and then little lymph nodes everywhere. And these guys actually return fluid to the blood up here. Unlike the circulatory system, which um, runs continuously, so it's a, it's a fully connected uh, circuit, lymphatics are one way. So everything starts in the fluid surrounding the tissues, so interstitial fluid, and it ends by emptying into venous blood vessels. The vessels have the same basic setup as blood vessels, except that they're thinner, so the walls aren't as thick. Um, there are more valves, and they start as dead ends. So instead of never really starting, you know, instead of just being connected to the heart on either side, um, like blood vessels are, these guys actually start as little dead ended capillaries. The lymphatic capillaries are more permeable than blood capillaries. So unlike blood capillaries where um, proteins and cells and other larger things cannot make it through, lymphatic capillaries um, are able to fit these larger molecules and cells in. Um, that's because the endothelial cells that make up these capillaries um, don't have tight junctions in between them, so they're not very tightly fitted. Instead, they're kind of more loosely overlapped, like a, a tile roof. Um, and then they will actually kind of open and make space in between them, so they kind of act as mini valves. They'll kind of open, let stuff in, but then nothing can come back out again. And the way that this works is that there are collagen fibers attaching those cells to the surrounding tissue structure. So they'll be attached to other cells or um, extracellular matrix components. And when we have an increase in the interstitial fluid, this kind of swells the fluid a little bit. It pulls everything apart and that actually opens the spaces between the cells of um, the endothelial cells. And that allows everything to flow into the lymphatic uh, capillaries until that pressure subsides and then they can close again. Um, this keeps the capillaries from collapsing as well because if, without those connections, you can kind of think about it like um, having like a tent or something anchored with, with supporting lines. Um, without those, it would just collapse um, with the fluid. So this is basically what it looks like um, woven throughout a capillary bed. We're going to have lymphatic capillaries. And this close-up shows you the individual endothelial cells with these collagen fibers kind of anchoring them to their surroundings, allowing the interstitial fluid in. Okay, so any fluid that is exiting the capillary bed but doesn't make it back in again gets absorbed by the lymph capillaries instead. That's the goal here. Because of that, lymph, the fluid in, within the lymphatic vessels, is um, everything that is filtered out of the capillaries that should be absorbed back in, as well as any other additional things in that interstitial fluid. So we didn't actually talk about this, um, but the capillary return, so bringing the fluid back in um, when we're doing capillary exchange, it's, it's not perfect. Uh, and we would potentially be losing about three liters of fluid a day from our vascular space into our extracellular space. That would cause major issues because that's a very large proportion of our total blood volume. So the most important job of the lymphatic vessels is to drain that fluid 
and put it back in the blood to maintain blood volume. Um, <clears throat> any proteins that are in this space are able to exit by that route as well. Um, otherwise, it's fairly similar to um, like plasma. Um, the proteins are different though because blood proteins stay in the blood and these are going to be different proteins. You'll also see them called terminal lymphatics and this image is just showing you that like microbes can make it in and it shows you a little more directly the fluid going from the circulatory system into the lymphatic system. Just like veins, uh, these lymphatic vessels come together forming larger vessels with thicker walls um, until they form this series of trunks and these trunks come together in the same into two returning vessels and you don't need to know the trunks it's just kind of meant to help with the visualization um this one probably belonged before that this is just another one, found a lot of pictures. Um, these trunks come together into two ducts. So the right lymphatic duct returns blood into the right subclavian vein, which is right under your collarbone. And the uh, thoracic duct drains into the um, left subclavian vein, and that's the end of the pathway. So we start with the capillaries in the tissue beds, and then we, um, and then we end here. Okay, so one way drainage. Um, one slightly different setup is how the lymphatic system drains the intestines. So when it's draining from the digestive system, not only is it draining the typical kind of fluid that drains from everywhere else, but it's also in charge of absorb of all of the lipids that are absorbed from our meals. So everything else that we absorb when we're digesting a meal goes straight into our blood capillaries. But lipids don't work that way. It's kind of too big of a package. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to the digestive system. Um, but either way, because these lymphatic capillaries are better at um, bringing larger molecules and cells in, um, they're the ones that are able to absorb the lipid. So we call the specific lymphatic capillaries in the intestines lacteals because once you put a bunch of lipid in this fluid, it looks white. And I'm pretty sure they were like, hey, it looks milky. So lact or milk. Anyway, um, uh, and then the term we use for the lipid-rich lymph is chyle. It, like the name, but spelled differently. It must have a Greek origin, because that's usually where we get K um, sounding noises, okay? So this is one um, slightly different case, but it goes back with the same, follows the same pathway I just showed you, um, and then that's how the lipids get into the blood. And what happens after that, we'll talk about uh, with the digestive system. Uh, so here's a diagram of a lacteal in, um, this is a villus of the small intestine. And there's connective tissue and blood vessels in here as well. And so this is the little lacteal for absorbing lipids. And um, this is showing you um, kind of where they are, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about this later. Lots and lots of lymphatics in the, in the intestines. Now, um, lymphatic uh, vessels have the same issues that veins have in getting fluid to um, flow in the appropriate direction. And unlike veins, there is no pump, however far away. So there's no heart equivalent to the lymphatic system. The whole thing is at very low pressure. Um, and so it uses all of the same mechanisms 
that um, veins use, with the exception of, there's no sympathetic, to my knowledge, um, there's no sympathetic input here, but it uses most of the same mechanisms that um, venous return uses, um, but on lymphatic vessels. So we've got valves, even more valves than in veins to prevent backflow. Um, whenever lymph, uh, lymphatic vessels flow through skeletal muscles, the action of your skeletal muscles helps move fluid. And then pressure changes within the thoracic cavity will also help by decreasing, when you decrease the pressure in the thoracic cavity, then you're um, increasing the pressure gradient for flow. The one thing that the lymphatics do that veins don't is um, the smooth muscle in the walls, so within that tunica media, is actually able to contract in a rhythmic fashion and can essentially pump the fluid forward. So this is called peristaltic movement. Um, this a very similar type of movement is actually possible in our digestive system so we'll talk about it more when we get there um kind of makes me feel like we should have covered that first but whatever um so yeah so there's this this is the bonus so they might not be able to like veno constrict by sympathetic tone but they can sort of gently pump the fluid forward All right, so when we look at these different uh, lymphoid tissues and organs, um, we tem tend to find the same types of cells within them. Um, lymphoid cells are actually immune cells that reside within lymphoid tissues. Um, and then there are uh, connective tissue supporting cells that make the scaffold that forms the framework of the organ. So you may or may not remember, we talked about reticular connective tissue uh, way back when we did tissues. Um, but this is what reticular connective tissue does. It forms the framework for lymphoid organs. And within that framework of reticular fibers, uh, we see these types of cells. So lymphocytes, which is where we, all of this stuff gets their name from the same stuff, right? So lymphatic system, lymphocytes, they're all related. Uh, there's multiple kinds of lymphocytes. We'll talk about them more later. Um, T cells and B cells are the big ones. Macrophages for phagocytosis of anything that's filtered out in, um, in the lymph or from anywhere else. Uh, dendritic cells capture antigens. We'll talk more about antigens later, but remember we talked about the ones on red blood cells already. And then uh, reticular cells are the ones that are making the reticular fibers and forming the uh, framework or scaffold, which is actually called stroma. All of the lymphoid tissues primary function is to give the lymphocytes somewhere to be. The lymphocytes hang out and then they have immune responses when the right pathogen comes along. And how that works is something that we'll cover as we work our way through this material. The two main types of lymphoid tissue are the diffuse tissues. These are where they're actually embedded within other uh, body systems and organs. And then there's uh, lymphoid follicles. These are also called nodules. And these are at locations where um, the risk of invasion is higher. So they're kind of like fortifying. Now, I've mentioned lymphoid tissues and lymphoid organs. So the difference is basically whether or not they're encapsulated. We've talked about a few types of organs at this point, and um, you know, they tend to have you know, walls, right? Walls and layers, and there's usually some sort of outer layer. So if something has that kind of outer layer that keeps it fully separated from other things, then it's an organ, and if it doesn't, if it's just within the other types of tissue, then it's just a tissue. 
Okay, so that's the difference between those two things. Uh, the organs have two types. There are primary lymphoid organs, and those are the ones that actually make the lymphocytes. So red bone marrow is responsible for making mature B cells, and the thymus is responsible for making mature T cells. Those are the only two. Everything else is secondary, and a secondary lymphoid organ is where we're actually carrying out immune surveillance. So the monitoring and having immune responses when we're exposed to antigens, um, that's gonna happen here. So that's the lymph nodes, the spleen, um, and then all of the different uh, tissues uh, end up under there too. So we have things like our tonsils, I'm sure you've heard of tonsils before, um, and then there's some other ones and we're gonna cover that. We'll start with the lymph nodes because the lymph nodes, uh, first of all, they're the most abundant of the organs because they're everywhere, as I showed you on that diagram. They're also the major overlap organ. They're the thing that ties the lymphatic system together as far as like the lymphatic vessels to the immune system because they're the only ones that actually filter the lymph. So they're super important um, because that lymph is the fluid coming from all of the tissue beds. And they are typically um, located in clusters, although they are throughout the whole lymphatic uh, vessel system. Um, whenever they, uh, the vessels come together, so when they're converging, you know, got a bunch of them like here, this is where we get a big old cluster. Because then we have stuff coming from multiple parts of the body. Um, and we're aware of some of these because uh, they're close enough to the surface that they get swollen when they're active. So, you know, we've got some under, under our jaw, we've got some in our armpits, we've got some in our groin. Those are a couple of the areas where we have really big clusters. So their job is cleaning the lymph by filtering it and giving macrophages access to everything. And then if it's something that's actually disease related, um, providing the immune system with access to get activated. So lymph nodes are basically like teeny tiny kidney, uh, kidney bean shaped things. And we typically have multiple lymphatic vessels bringing lymph in. You can see the little valves in there. And then a single exiting vessel carrying it out. That's the basic setup. And then um, the reason why there's different colors and shapes in here is because there's organization to it. We're not going to worry about that. We're just going to worry about the fact that like, you know, there's B cells, T cells, macrophages, dendritic cells in here, and we're filtering. Okay, that's our, that's our big concern. Oh, this is where I put that. Cool. So um, I already told you this, um, but the uh, lymph is emptied into the right and left subclavian veins, and that's the end of the circuit. So here's another picture of that. Um, bringing it in right here. I feel like the other one really did it. So all of the other lymphatic stuff then is not connected. Um, so it's the cells that, that make them all the same system um, because there's no connection to the lymphatic vessels by any of these other organs. The spleen is the only um, lymphatic organ that filters the blood. So it serves for the blood basically the same function that the lymph nodes serve for the lymph. Um, it's a site for uh, lymphocytes to really hang out and multiply if they need to have an immune response. It is, of course, also another site of immune surveillance because it is filtering something. Um, it also helps like manage the blood. So whenever blood cells get old um, or platelets get old, it pulls them out and destroys them. It removes any other debris or foreign material in the blood. Um, it's in charge of breaking down hemoglobin and recycling and reusing its um, components 
after it breaks down the blood cells. It'll store additional platelets and monocytes for emergency use. Um, and before we're born, it's actually one of the sites of red blood cell formation. Give me one second. I'm hearing weird noises. So yeah, spleens filter blood. Uh, the spleen um, has an interesting setup in its anatomy where it's kind of got two portions to it. So it's got an immune portion. We call it the white pulp because it kind of looks white. And that's where all the lymphocytes are. And then we have um, the red pulp, and it's the part that actually filters the blood and pulls out red blood cells um, and then uses macrophages to break them down. And they're kind of organized in sort of a striped fashion throughout the spleen so that uh, the white pulp is organized around the blood vessels and then um, the blood pools through the red pulp and um, that's how it gets filtered appropriately. Um, everything else is tissues. So we have a couple of different types of tissues, but the big one is this stuff. So we abbreviate it as MALT. It stands for Mucosa Associated Lymphoid Tissue. And it means that these are the lymphoid tissues within the walls of um, organs with mucous membranes. All right, so it's just, it's just about mucous membranes here. And remember that the systems that have mucous membranes are the ones that have um, openings to the external world, right? So this is like respiratory system, digestive system. Um, to some extent, this is uh, the urinary system and uh, the reproductive systems as well. Um, we have certain places where there's a, a lot of this uh, tissue, so like the tonsils, um, these things called Peyer's patches, and also the appendix we think has a major role here as a lymphoid, um, as a site of lymphoid tissue. So the tonsils are actually a ring of lymphoid tissue. Um, they're kind of clumped in discrete masses. Um, we have two palatine tonsils, a lingual, a pharyngeal, and we've got these weird little tubal tonsils. And they're in a ring around um, your, your, basically your oral and nasal pharynx. So remember the oral nasal pharynx is the back of your throat, essentially, and that's where all the air and food is coming through. That's where all of your contamination is coming through. So it has to monitor that whole area before things either go down the esophagus or down the trachea. So for example, the palatines are here. These are especially the ones that get inflamed. If you've ever had strep throat, um, these are the guys that are having problems. Um, and then uh, the pharyngeal is uh, back here beyond your uvula. Your uvula is not part of your um, lymphoid tissues. So it kind of sits up here uh, around your soft palate. Um, the lingual one is here at the base of your tongue. So you can't see it because it's too far back, but it's right there. Um, and then the tubules are in there somewhere. They never get, um, they really never get a picture to be honest, but they're, they're finishing up the ring. I'm sure they're on the sides or something. It doesn't really matter. Probably around your um, nasopharyngeal tubes. So your tonsils are monitoring everything you eat, drink, or inhale. Um, because they are not fully encapsulated, that's why they are tissues and not organs, even though they do have discrete locations that we can see. Um, and the way that they're really good at um, monitoring and removing pathogens is that their surfaces have these crypts. So um, basically really deep pits um, in the epithelium help bring everything in and give the lymphoid tissues ready access. 
things that make it into the intestinal tract um, will be further monitored by Peyer's patches. So Peyer's patches um, are kind of like tonsils, but they're in the walls of the small intestine. Specifically, they're in the distal portion. So they also help monitor for anything. So we do have bacteria in our large colon. So it goes small intestine um, to large intestine. And so being located down here means that if anything sneaks up this way, which it's not supposed to, but we can monitor that. And then anything that survived the whole digestive process will also be um, monitored. So they're really just like, it's these purple guys. They're just thickened nodules within the walls. And um, I'll bring them up again when we get to the digestive system. The appendix also helps monitor um, in the large intestine. So we think that that's because it's in a really good position, it's kind of at the beginning of the large intestine. Um, it's exposed to a lot of bacteria. Um, we know that there are a lot of lymphoid follicles in here as well, so it looks a lot like the Peyer's patches. Um, and so this helps protect us, again, from things that come in by the digestive system. So your appendix is here. Uh, sits off. This is the beginning of your large intestine. The end of your small intestine comes in like this. So your Peyer's patches would be located here. And then we empty into the large and your appendix is sitting right there ready. We also have um, nodules in our airways. So um, you could technically call this malt as well, but they like to call it BALT, bronchus associated lymphoid tissue tissue. Um, and so these guys sit in the larger airway, so remember the bronchi, as they branch, it's bifurcations. So remember that we've got the trachea coming down, first branch, and then they just keep branching from there. So at these branch points, we're going to have accumulations of lymphoid tissue within the walls. These guys would be in like the submucosa of the airways. So that way things that are inhaled that all of our mucus and ciliated epithelium isn't catching get caught before they make it down into the bronchioles and the alveoli. Uh, the primary lymphatic organs do not do immune surveillance, so they are just making these cells. Now, the bone marrow actually produces all of the formed elements of the blood, including the lymphocytes. So all of the lymphocytes start in the red bone marrow, but the cells that are going to become T cells migrate to the thymus, and they mature there in a complex series of processes that we're not gonna worry about. Um, but they have to do it in the thymus because the thymus makes special hormones that regulate the maturation process. The cells that'll become B cells just stay in the bone marrow until they're mature and then they go into circulation just like all the other blood cells. Um, the thymus is probably one of the most common organs that no one has ever heard of. Uh, and that's because um, for most of us, it is just like a teeny tiny little thing. So the thymus is fairly large when you're born. Um, it's very active when you're a kid um, because it's cranking out a whole bunch of T cells. Uh, but then by the time you hit puberty, its production is really slowed down. It actually shrinks um, and a lot of it gets replaced by fatty tissue. Um, but it actually does continue to make T cells throughout life. Um, the difference, let's not worry about that. We've already covered this, sorry. So um, remember again, the difference here is that there's no immune surveillance, okay, with the primaries. Uh, again, it's, it sits in the thoracic cavity, 
basically above the heart, okay? It's in, in an area called the mediastinum. And it's, it's got all these little lobes. And because it's got a capsule, like it says here, that makes it an organ and not just a tissue. All right, so that's our, our, our lymph stuff. And now we're gonna tie that into the immune system. Um, the immune system is different because it has no organs that it can call its own. Like if we divide out the immune system from the lymphatic system, there are no organs of the immune system. Um, the immune system is just cells and chemicals and components scattered throughout the body in all different body systems that are protecting us. Um, we can divide it into two basic parts. The innate immune system um, is always protecting us regardless of whether or not it knows what's invading us. Um, so it's always working. And it involves a, a combination of barriers, um, molecules, and cells. Um, whereas the adaptive immune system requires exposure to pathogens before they can mount a response. So the adaptive immune system learns and it's more effective, but it takes longer because it requires an exposure. And this is a combination of cells and the products of those cells. When we look at the cells of the immune system, there's a big overlap with the cells of the lymphatic system, but there are additional ones. So all of the leukocytes, which remember is white blood cells circulating in the blood, as well as cells that the leukocytes become when they're in tissues, all of which come from the bone marrow, are the cells of the immune system. So that's lymphatic cells plus, sorry, additional cells. Um, the functions vary by the type of cell. So we have phagocytic cells to ingest pathogens. The lymphocytes are mostly in charge of the adaptive immune system, but we'll talk a little bit about how there is, there's a ton of overlap. So even though we divide the system into parts, it's like the nervous system, like it's a whole system that works together. Um, it just happens to have some divisions to it that do different things. And then it also contains granulitic cells that have cytop cytoplasmic granules with chemicals to help mediate the immune responses. Um, and we talked about those guys already, right? We'll go over them again and look at um, what they're doing here. Um, this is just uh, what happens in the bone marrow, so stem cells leading to um, further specialization until we get to all of the cells um, of the blood, including red blood cells and platelets, but they're not part of the immune cells, just the white blood cells are. So we'll start with the lymphocytes. Um, I've mentioned that there's different kinds of lymphocytes and um, generally speaking, uh, we break it up into uh, four kinds. So there's the B cells. B cells make antibodies that, oh man, that's their job. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a bit. And then uh, T cells actually kill cells that are infected with intracellular pathogens. So these guys are most important with viruses. Plasma cells are considered a separate type, but really they're just B cells once they've actually started making antibodies. And then natural killer cells are similar to T cells in that they can kill, um, oops, that's a typo, kill cells infected with viruses um, or cancer, um, except that they work with the innate immune system rather than the uh, adaptive, which is where the B and T cells are. All right, so we're gonna start by looking at the components of the innate immune system, and then um, we'll tackle the adaptive. <clears throat> 
Um, this little diagram is meant to show you how there's a lot of overlap between the innate and the adaptive immunity. Um, you can read more about it in your textbook and it's good to come back to after we've talked about all of these things. We like to start by talking about barrier defenses. So they don't sound like they're part of a system or anything. It's just that we happen to have things in place that keep stuff out of our bodies. So they're the physical barriers that prevent invasion. Basically anything that's part of the exterior surfaces of the body are part of our barrier defenses. So this is the very first line of defense that we have and it keeps the vast majority of things out of our bodies. This includes the skin, like literally the skin in its entirety, but especially the epidermis. Um, it includes the oral cavity and the lumen or inside of the entire digestive system, as well as all other mucosal surfaces, because the mucosa is the epithelium that we have for every surface of the body that's exposed to the external environment. So these are our barrier defenses. It's mostly the um, epithelia of, uh, of the mucosa and any products on those surfaces. Uh, since the skin covers the majority of the outside of our body, it's gonna be the most important barrier. And um, that's one of the reasons why the outermost layers are dead. So the keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. One of the advantages of having dead cells is that they are regularly shed. So exfoliation is actually part of immune function because it takes any pathogens with. Um, another nice thing is that our skin can be dry because they're dead. And that um, prevents most microbial growth from taking place. In addition, the secretions that we have, so our sweat and our oil production, actually decrease microbial growth. And if we sweat a lot, it's gonna wash away the microbes as well. So our sweat is deliberately a little bit acidic to create something called an acid mantle. Most pathogens do not grow well in acidic conditions. Um, our oil from our sebaceous glands has substances toxic to microbes. And then additionally, we make specific molecules that have antimicrobial activity in most of our secretions, actually, not just in what's on our skin. For the rest of these surfaces, for our mucosa or the epithelium of our mucous membranes, there's almost always mucus involved. And mucus is fantastic because it is sticky and it traps particles. And then when you have something like the respiratory tract with its ciliated uh, pseudostratified columnar epithelium, we take that mucus with trapped particles and we move it back out, okay? So um, the, the whole purpose of mucus, at least for, for external surfaces, is to trap stuff. Um, other things, um, in the digestive system. So the oral cavity, not only is it a nice thick mucous membrane because it is also a stratified squamous, although it's not keratinized. Um, we also have uh, antimicrobial components in our saliva. Lysozyme is a big one. We have it in a lot of other body secretions. It's an enzyme that actually digests bacterial cell walls. Um, one of the reasons why we have stomach acid is that it kills most pathogens in the food and beverages that we consume. Um, and then one of the advantages of having normal microbes, so having microbes that don't make us sick, bacteria and other um, single-celled organisms in our large intestine is that they keep the pathogens from growing instead um, by, by populating an area that favors microbial growth, um, we keep the healthy bacteria around, the ones that like us to stay healthy, and they keep out the bad ones. So that's barriers. Um, next up, we wanna look at cells and then molecules. So the cells of the innate immune system can attack anything that's foreign without previous exposure. 
And again, that's important because that's how the adaptive immune system works is that they need previous exposure first. So three types of cells make up the majority of the innate immune system cells. So macrophages and neutrophils as our phagocytic cells and then our natural killer cells. So these guys deal with extracellular issues, stuff outside of cells that they can just eat and digest. Natural killer cells deal with intracellular issues because you can't phagocytose an entire cell. Um, remember that the macrophages um, are circulating in our blood as monocytes and then they migrate into tissues and do their thing. Um, some macrophages are always in their tissues, so we call them fixed, and some of them are um, constantly moving through. So depending on the tissue that a macrophage is in, they have a wide variety of names. Uh, for example, a lot of them are called dendritic cells. Uh, we have these in our skin, for example. Um, and it just depends on um, it depends on the tissue and the system that they're in, but they are all ultimately macrophages, ooh, ma macrophages um, and their job is to eat stuff that shouldn't be there. Neutrophils do something very similar. Uh, the difference is that these guys get there first and then macrophages do it better, but they get there later and clean up the mess. So these guys um, arrive very fast to any place um, where uh, tissues are damaged, they release chemicals that attract the neutrophils by a process called chemotaxis. Um, and because these guys do also have granules, they're not just phagocytosing, uh, they, um, they, can, they can release granules that help them kill the pathogens as well. So they don't always have to eat it to kill it. Natural killer cells actually make infected cells kill themselves, and they are able to act against some cancer cells too, uh, which makes them uh, definitely a target for uh, cancer treatment research. Uh, so yeah, these guys are all about the intracellular pathogens, which is viruses and then technically speaking, cancer cells because they've gone rogue. Now the question is if, if they already know how to kill things, how? How do they know that? Uh, and it turns out that um, most pathogens have specific carbohydrates on the outsides of their membranes and walls that we can recognize as being foreign. So they're called pattern recognition receptors. Uh, these are receptors that are um, innate immune cells have that let them recognize a variety of things. Now you definitely don't need to know any of them, I just, it's a good picture, okay? So basically stuff that sticks off of bacteria, viruses, parasites, um, and fungi, some fungi at least, um, can be recognized as foreign um, and that allows you know, the, uh, the neutrophils, macrophages, and um, natural killer cells to attack. In addition to these cells, there are a variety of chemicals that can be used to help the immune response. So we call them chemical mediators because they can change cell function. Uh, they're important in both the innate and adaptive immune responses. Um, there are a lot of different ones, but we'll just put them in a couple of categories. So cytokines and chemokines, early induced proteins, and complement proteins. Cytokines and chemokines are communicating molecules. So they signal between cells. Um, the cytokines are able to let cells in, in the same tissues inform each other of what's going on. And then chemokines are the ones that act in chemotaxis. So they are attracting the neutrophils and the macrophages to come clean up the mess. Early induced proteins um, are produced in response to stimuli. 
for example, um, when cells are infected with viruses, they make a group of proteins called interferons that are released to travel to other cells to inform them that there is a virus nearby and that they need to make antiviral proteins to protect themselves from being infected. So interferons are interesting because they don't save the infected cell, they're meant to save the neighbors. Um, other early induced proteins will do similar things, but that's the only example we're going to worry about. Um, I don't know why I put this here. I guess I do. Anyway, um, a lot of different um, of these uh, chemical mediators will bind to pathogens. We'll talk about more of this later when we get to antibodies. So this is true in both the innate and adaptive immune response. And when they bind, it's to make it easier for the cells of the immune system to attack, mostly for phagocytosis. And this process of sticking to whatever's identifiable as a pathogen is called opsonization. So you kind of just like mob um, these pathogens and it slows them down and makes them easier targets for phagocytosis. One of the things that can do that is the complement protein system. So the complement system or complement is a bunch of proteins. They're circulating in the blood. So the liver makes most of them and they're circulating in the blood. And it works very similarly to the clotting cascade in that we have these things that are already in the blood and they just need the right Oh, Jesus. They just need the right stimulus to activate. When they are activated, they amplify the inflammatory process, which we'll talk about in a second. They um, will bind to pathogens for phagocytosis, so they contribute to this opsonization that I told you about. And they actually can kill bacteria directly. So cytolysis is just a general name for destroying a cell and they do it by punching holes in them. So they form into this thing called a membrane attack complex, which puts a hole or a pore into the bacteria and the bacteria just kind of like, brrr, they deflate. So this is a diagram showing how it works, um, a chain reaction of activating these proteins until a bunch of them come together and form pores and the bacteria just kind of um, gets destroyed. So um, typically we end up with a movement of water into the bacterium and then they burst like balloons. Very satisfying, I'm sure, although on a microscopic level. So that's complement. A little bit different than the other guys, but super effective, very important component of the innate immune system, um, including that opsonization thing. So I already mentioned inflammation a couple times, but what is it? Well, inflammation or the inflammatory process is kind of the cornerstone of innate immunity. It's basically how damaged tissues uh, try to defend themselves when they're injured. So regardless of the cause, whether it's physical trauma, infection, chemical burn, um, thermal burn, the general inflammatory process is going to be the same. It involves a lot of cytokines and other chemical mediators. And it has what are called the cardinal signs of inflammation. So that's redness, swelling, heat, and pain and sometimes loss of function. Depends on the injury, or it depends on the, the in, yeah, depends on the injury and where it is and how bad it is. The way that it works is that when we have tissue damage, we have um, these monitoring cells um, that are gonna release cytokines. In this case, it's a cell called a mast cell, and it's going to release histamine. 
Uh, if you've ever had an allergic reaction to anything, histamine's the guy that makes it all itchy and red and maybe kind of painful and hot and swollen. Um, one of the things that it's going to do is chemotaxis, so bring in the phagocytes. Um, it's going to increase blood flow. That's how we get the heat, the redness, and the swelling, is that we get a bunch more blood flowing into the area. Um, and some of the, the um, chemicals actually trigger our pain receptors, and that's why it ends up being painful. So the reason why this happens is because it limits the spread of the pathogens by bringing in um, more, more uh, fluid. Um, by bringing in the phagocytes, we're removing the damaged tissues and pathogens. Uh, the chemicals also stimulate the tissues to start healing. And as a bonus, we alert the adaptive immune system, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Okay, so mostly this occurs with increased blood flow. Um, and it might be uncomfortable when it happens, but it does have a purpose, and usually um, that purpose uh, ends up being for the best. All right, so now we're going to look at adaptive immunity and kind of look at the differences between them and what T cells do and what B cells do. The big differences here are that adaptive immunity takes longer to kick in and requires exposure. Okay, those are its downsides compared to innate immunity. But once it has been exposed, it remembers the exposure and is very, very fast for any subsequent exposures. It's also very specific to each pathogen and it's systemic. So it, it protects the entire body, even if the exposure is very local. We divide up adaptive immunity into two parts. But again, just like innate and adaptive work together and have overlap, the two types of adaptive immunity have overlap as well. In a nutshell, the first type is cellular or cell-mediated immunity, and this is what the T cells do. The second type is humoral or antibody-mediated immunity, and this is what the B cells do, all right? So it's just kind of split up between the two types of lymphocytes because they do different things. Both types have memory. So immunological memory means that you need a first exposure to have an immune response at all. So before exposure, you don't know that this thing needs a response. Um, the first exposure causes a slow response. We call it the primary adaptive response. It takes time for all of the, the steps to be taken to have an appropriate response. But once that happens, we have memory and every subsequent one triggers a secondary response, which is very rapid and um, usually is able to stop the pathogen before you even know you're sick. Both uh, parts use antigens. So we talked a little bit about antigens before. Um, we're going to go back through it now because when we were talking about them before, it was a little bit more like in context of, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, blood types. So this is a little different because now it's, you know, actual bad antigens. So antigens are defined as molecules that trigger an immune response, and they are the targets of the adaptive immune system. So the adaptive immune system, yes, it takes care of pathogens, but it does it by focusing on the antigens. So this can be toxins and venoms. So even without an actual like bacteria or something, our immune system can still work against uh, molecules that will cause us harm. Um, when we're looking at um, actual pathogens, it's usually components of our plasma membranes. 
uh, not ours, sorry, <laughs> components of the pathogen's plasma membranes or cell walls. And typically they're larger and fairly unique molecules, which is how we're able to be very specific. It's like fingerprints. Everybody's got their own, they're not the same as others. And by having um, that difference, um, we can distinguish one from another. It also shouldn't be anything that we're capable of making ourselves. So anything that's too similar to our own stuff, we don't want to have an immune response to because then we would accidentally attack our own cells and components. So the immune system actually has to learn to distinguish between self antigens and non self antigens and self antigens are, for example, the kinds of things like the, the, um, the, the blood cell types because those blood red blood cell antigens when you know when you have something like B that's a self antigen it's your own. Um, pictures of antigens because I like pictures, I feel like they're important. Um, some self antigens are actually necessary for the immune response itself. So we have these proteins called major histocompatibility complexes or MHCs that um, are like ID cards for your cells. They basically tell the immune system that this is one of our own cells and we shouldn't attack it. And again, they're like fingerprints. They're unique to everyone, although identical twins should have the same ones because it's genetically determined. Um, these guys are also important in showing foreign antigens to T cells, which we'll touch on a little bit. Um, in order to understand that, we're going to very briefly go through how we get these B and T cells ready to go. So they actually have to go through a maturation process um, where they start by forming from stem cells in the bone marrow and then they learn uh, immunocompetence and self-tolerance, which I will talk about in a second. And then once they are mature, then they go into the secondary lymphoid organs and the blood to hang out until they're needed. Um, once they encounter an antigen that they are able to respond to, that activates them. And we'll talk about what happens afterwards um, in a couple of slides. So the maturation process is actually really rigorous. Um, most lymphocytes that are made in the bone marrow don't mature to circulation. And that's because they have to recognize and attack foreign antigens, as well as recognizing and not attacking self antigens. And if they can't do both, then they're useless and potentially harmful to our own bodies. So positive selection is making sure that a lymphocyte is able to recognize MHC molecules because that's um, how they know to recognize self. And then negative selection is how they learn to not attack self antigens. So you have to have a good defense and a good offense, basically, okay? And most of them don't make the cut because it's apparently really, really hard to do. So maturation in the bone marrow and the thymus is a critical part of having a functional immune system. When we look at what happens to the ones that make it out, um, We'll start with the T cells. So the T cells or the T lymphocytes actually have a wide variety of roles in the adaptive immune response. Not only do they um, do the whole cell mediated immunity where they attack cells infected with viruses and things, but they also have an important role in helping B cells with the humoral immunity. Um, T cells are also weird because they can't recognize free floating antigen. So if it's just like circulating in the lymph and it's an antigen from a pathogen, they're not going to notice. Instead, they need other cells to catch that antigen and prepare it properly, which is called antigen processing. 
and then stick it on the outside of their cell and show it to the T cell, which is called antigen presentation. T cells are weird. All right, so they can't just recognize an antigen. Instead, they need that antigen attached to an MHC molecule, and they have to bind the antigen and the MHC molecule in order to activate. Only three types of cells can actually present antigen to T cells. So we call them antigen presenting cells or APCs. So you can think about them as like master chefs. All right, T cells are snobs and they will only eat what master chefs give them. Okay, it has to be prepared very accurately. So dendritic cells, which hang out in the tissues, um, if they uh, pick up an antigen, they'll migrate into the secondary lymphoid tissues and find T cells to show it to them. Macrophages are going to present antigens after phagocytosing them. And then B cells can also present antigen, but they only do it for their own purposes, and we'll talk about that in a second. So here's a dendritic cell, I like pictures. And this is kind of showing you the process of antigen presentation. Uh, this is in your textbook. Now we don't need to know all the details um, but this is just showing you the processing portion occurs inside the cell, and then presentation is interacting with the T cells. So once T cells are exposed to antigen, properly presented by antigen presenting cells, um, if the T cell recognizes the antigen as foreign, it will activate. Activation of T cells causes something called clonal expansion and selection. So clonal expansion is just the fancy way to say that they undergo a whole bunch of cell division, so mitotic division. So we rapidly make a whole bunch of T cells from one. And we make two different types, which is what selection means. So we're going to make effector T cells and memory T cells. Effector T cells actually come in two different types as well. I'm sorry, I'm sure you're sensing a theme here. Every single time I tell you something, I then divide it up into two more. I'm sorry about that, that's just the way it works. Um, <clears throat> cytotoxic T cells are the ones that actually attack foreign cells or cells infected with viruses. And then helper T cells, um, actually work with the innate immune system and the humoral immune system um, to, as well as helping the cytotoxic ones do their job. Uh, there are memory versions of both of these types of effectors. And what the memory guys do is they go sit on the sidelines and wait until we get these antigens again. So the helper T cells have a wide variety of functions and they're all super duper important. And most of the way that they carry that out is by secreting cytokines. So you can see that um, the uh, cytokines, like these, these um, chemical mediators, sorry, that was what I was looking for, um, are important not only in the innate, but also in the adaptive system. These cytokines regulate the activities of pretty much all of the other immune cells. Um, and uh, even the B cells require the cytokine input. So because they secrete um, these chemicals, including something called interleukin, um, they will attract both neutrophils and natural killer cells. So phagocytic cells and the guys that can make virus infected cells kill themselves in the innate, um, they can attract macrophages and trap them there. So we've got all of our innate cells there. And they stimulate both effector T cells and B cells to activate. So helper T cells are literally the most important cells of the immune system because they activate both the innate immune response as well as both branches of the adaptive. 
So without helper T cells, our immune system is drastically reduced in effectiveness and scope. All right, these guys are really, really important. Now, as far as what the effector or cytotoxic T cells do, they kill target cells. They basically are the targeted version of natural killer cells. Um, and so the goal, again, is to kill cells infected with viruses and to do it before the virus actually successfully replicates and, you know, then releases a bunch of viruses to spread through your body and make more viruses. And they're pretty good at it, especially when there's a secondary response. All right, so the memory T cells, like I said, they go sit on the sidelines. Memory T cells live for a really long time. Some of them can live for your entire life. And when they are exposed to antigen, they, were, they activate far more quickly than um, what we call naive T cells, so the ones that have never been activated before. So the memory T cells are why our secondary immune responses are really, really fast, because they will undergo all this activation process stuff way, way faster than one that's never done it before. All right, so these guys are what we call the hallmark of adaptive immunity. They're why we can actually learn by exposure to pathogens, immunologically speaking, though, not, not learning in the brain sense. When we look at the B cell side of things, we have the humoral or antibody response. Now, the B cells don't need antigen presenting cells. They can pick up antigen all by themselves, no problem. And when they activate, the effector B cells are the plasma cells. And their job is to be factories for antibodies. And we'll talk about the, what the antibodies do in a second. When they activate, we will also make memory B cells. And they will do the same thing as the memory T cells. They'll go hang out. And then when we encounter that antigen again, we'll get an immediate activation and a ton of antibody production. So the antibodies um, are also called immunoglobulins or gamma globulin gamma globulin and you may recall that they form a portion of the globulins that are circulating in the blood as part of our plasma proteins they're the only ones that aren't made in the liver um, and have like carrier protein functions so their job is to not only be the receptors on b cells for the antigen but also to be secreted into you name it any sort of blood saliva, intestinal, whatever, they get secreted everywhere and they bind to the antigens that are there. So these guys are going to act on extracellular pathogens. Um, these are all the types of antibody we have. We actually have a lot, not just one. Kind of cool. You don't need to know this, but you know, it makes a nice chart. Um, this is showing you the clonal selection as well and how that works. Excuse me, so B cell gets activated um, by binding antigen. We make a bunch of um, effectors here, including a memory guy and a bunch of plasma cells. All these guys crank out antibody, and then this guy goes and waits. If we ever get exposed to the antigen again, it makes more memory cells as well as a bunch more plasma cells, and they make a ton of antibody, okay? That's B cell function in a nutshell. Now, in order to fully activate, B cells actually have to bind to helper T cells. So remember I mentioned that B cells can be antigen presenting cells, but they do it for their own reasons. Well, what they do is they tell the helper T cells, hey, I got activated, I need your help. Because remember the helper T cells make all sorts of cytokines. And that makes the helper T cell release this, the cytokines that are specific to the B cells and that fully activates them. They can't have as strong of a response if they're just binding the antigen. Um, they need to bind the antigen and let the helper T cells know so they can get this extra boost. Okay, so those T cell cytokines give the B cells the boost they need for a full humoral response. All right, so we have some words that go along with the immunological memory. 
kind of, I kind of mentioned them before, but um, just to give you a little more detail um, as far as the humoral response goes. So the primary immune response from time of first antigen exposure, it takes three to six days for plasma cells to start producing antibody. And for a secondary immune exposure, um, it, you can make new plasma cells within hours of exposure. And um, within two to three days, not only are you producing antibody, but you've actually got the levels up really high and they can last for weeks to months or potentially even years. We know that we can get high antibody levels for specific pathogens for um, years at a time. It kind of looks like this, antigen, and then, you know, like almost a week later, um, we get our primary response, second antigen exposure, a couple days later, we get our secondary, and not only is it faster, but it's also much stronger. So when we're talking about having immunity to something, we're usually referring to having antibodies against it because we don't have any direct way to measure the cell mediated immune response of the T cells. But we can measure antibody levels in the blood and we know how to measure specific types of antibodies so that we know which things we have immunity to. We can divide immunity up into two categories, active and passive. Active immunity means that not only are you making your own antibodies, but you're doing it with your own plasma cells. Um, natural active immunity means that you got the disease and you recovered from it. Artificial active immunity means you were vaccinated for the disease, which stimulated the immune response without you having to get sick from it. So that lets you skip all of the potential negative consequences of having the disease, especially when a lot of these diseases often have, um, you know, potential fatalities. And I know you're all aware of that because we're dealing with a situation right now where we don't have artificial active immunity yet, which is super scary. Now, passive immunity is when you have the antibodies circulating, but you don't have the plasma cells to make them. Instead, you got the antibodies from somebody else who has active immunity. So you can take those antibodies and you can give them to somebody, and there's two ways to do it. Natural passive immunity is what happened when you were a baby. So before you were born through the placenta, which is the blood connection between mother and baby, antibodies were passing into, the, into your blood or the baby's blood. And then after birth, through the milk in the first day, it's called colostrum. Hopefully we'll talk about that when we get to the reproductive tract. Um, that gives babies a passive immunity while their own immune system matures and they're able to start developing their own active immunities. Now you can have artificial passive immunity as well. So we can actually transfer immunoglobulins from one person to another. And that's why, um, you know, in our current situation, we're uh, looking for people that have recovered and trying to get plasma donations from them. Because if we can remove these globulins and give them to people that are currently sick, maybe we can get a jump start on their immune response. I haven't heard yet whether or not that is proven to be effective yet. I think we still might be in the testing phases of that, but it's got a pretty strong possibility because this is A, something that we've successfully done before in previous um, diseases, and also it makes sense because we're just replicating the humoral side of the immune response. So hopefully that'll be helpful until we're able to get to the vaccination process. All right, so the antibodies themselves, how they work, they bind to antigen, all right? Pe like period, that is how they work. Now, the consequences of the binding do depend on the situation. So um, we can have agglutination, which is what occurs when the antigens are stuck to cells. We know that because that's how red, uh, red blood cells um, react when you're testing for them for blood type right and this is also 
why we end up with um, transfusion reactions if somebody gets the wrong blood type because their antibodies are binding and clumping that blood. We can also neutralize. So when we have uh, viruses or toxins, um, we can simply prevent them from having an action by binding to them. Um, precipitation is when we have an antigen that was soluble, so it was uh, dissolved in water and it falls out of solution because of the antibodies binding. It's basically the molecular version of agglutination. And these things all mark them for phagocytosis. So macrophages and neutrophils are able to come in and engulf them. It also, um, the other thing that we can do is this is one of the triggers that activates complement. So the complement system can be activated by antibody binding to antigen. And complement is then going to enhance the inflammatory response and remember can directly kill bacteria. Okay, so antibodies are pretty awesome in their actions. Their only downside is that they cannot really be effective against intracellular pathogens. So they don't work as well during active viral infections because the viruses are already in the cells, but they can bind to virus that's in the blood and other fluids. All right, one more thing before we're done, um, just to show you um, what happens when your immune system goes crazy. So um, you see a lot of stuff about boosting your immune system. Um, and uh, people that know how immune systems work know that you don't want to boost your immune system because when your immune system works too hard, it actually is bad for you. So hypersensitivity responses are immune responses that are more severe than are warranted by the exposure. And this is basically how we get things like allergies and um, inflammatory responses to things that we shouldn't be responding to. Um, and it's also similar to how sometimes when we're sick with something, our immune response is what uh, causes us injury or death rather than the actual pathogen itself. So just, just real quick to show you in part because if you're like me, you have allergies and it's just nice to know what's happening and because we've already talked about blood typing so that you kind of know how this stuff works. So we call them hypersensitivity responses. They're all different. We'll just, um, we're just very briefly, I'm just mentioning it here, okay? So type one is allergies. Type two is what happens when you get blood transfusions that um, are not matched properly. So essentially the response to the agglutination. Um, type three uh, causes certain autoimmune diseases. And type four is a delayed response that we use to our advantage because if you've ever been tested for TB, um, that's actually taking advantage of the type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. Although it didn't occur unless you were positive for that test, which can happen without you having tuberculosis. Um, they're summarized in here. Um, so it's one, two, three, and four. Uh, you guys don't really need to know um, the details about this. Just know that there's a couple different types and the specific examples that I gave you. Um, if you're curious about um, immune responses, here's a couple of interesting resources about T cells specifically, um, since they are so important in all of the immune stuff. Um, hopefully that made sense. And um, let me know if you have any questions, shoot me an email in the next couple of days. Again, um, there's, a worksheet on Canvas under the practice quizzes for a circulatory system. I'll put ones up for immune and respiratory tomorrow. Um, your exam will be available from Saturday after, uh, evening through Sunday. And then on Monday, we're starting with a whole another section of stuff because we got a few more systems to get through. Um, and what well, we got like a month, a month to go 
um, to get through the course. All right, anybody have any questions? That's okay. All right, see you all next week.